All right, welcome back to the Neurosymbolic Channel. Uh, I'm Paulo Shakarian, and today I'm very pleased to interview uh, Pascal Hitzler, who is um, probably one of the earliest thinkers in what is, you know, now a uh, contemporary neurosymbolic AI. And I'd like to welcome you to the channel, Pascal. Thanks, Paulo. Thanks for having me. So maybe um, if we could start out by kind of giving us a little bit of your bio. And I think what I'm really interested in learning about is, you know, you've been at Neurosymbolic AI uh, for quite some time, uh, starting a workshop, I believe, in 2005, um, which is, you know, 15 years before it really became uh, popular like it is today. And really curious in, in what got you going down this road and uh, kind of, you know, how your initial training led to that. Yeah, my, my career path was was pretty much un, unplanned. I was playing things by ear and and uh, sometimes I think I just got lucky to, you know, find the right people and the right groups at, this, at the right time. I'm actually a mathematician originally. So I had my PhD in mathematics um, somewhere in the in the kind of in the, the nowhere, no man's land, uh, you could say between uh, artificial intelligence and mathematics. Uh, nobody was interested in at that time because we were in the middle of the AI winter. But um, there were some some mathematical issues I found interesting. And, and this is where I came from. It is a mathematics PhD thesis. Um, and then um, uh, at, towards the, the end of my time there, um, my my supervisor gave me gave me a paper uh, on by, by Stefan Heldobler um, from from Dresden, who who by the way recently died. He later on became my uh, he became my boss. Uh, so this is a, a quite quite a loss. I uh, just want to kind of mention that here. Um, and uh, uh, that that paper essentially uh, looked into. Um, representing logic programming, symbolic reasoning using artificial neural networks. And the reason my supervisor gave that paper to me was because there was a very obvious connection to the mathematical analysis I was doing on logic programming during the time. So, and, and I made the connection that became actually a chapter in my PhD thesis. So this is how I started with neurosymbolic. Uh, it also shows there were other people before me who were interested in that, but it was a, it was a very small uh, community. And then a few years later, when I was actually in, in Stefan Heldodos group, I, I, uh, I, I got uh, in contact with, with Arthur Garces in, in London. And I suggested to him, uh, we, we should start a workshop series on this, uh, which we then later did. I had moved on by that time to, to another position in Germany in Karlsruhe in my, my second postdoc position. Um, but we started that workshop on uh, neural, neural symbolic learning and reasoning back then. I guess I believe 2005 was the first one, um, and it was a it was a small event. Usually, it was uh, usually be kind of 15 or 20 people or so, um, but it was annually held at a key AI conference. So usually at Triple AI or at Ichkai. Um, and yes, there was interest, but at the same time, there was really no funding for it. Uh, and it was a small community because it was a niche topic because everything AI was a kind of no touch at that time. Um, but we kept it going um, more out of interest and because it, it's such a fascinating topic. Um, in the meantime, the workshop is really humming. So they, they just, uh, regretfully, I won't be able to be there this year, but it, it's been going annually since. Um, it will be in, uh, in Siena in Italy, uh, early July and uh, easy to find online. Uh, or I can provide a link. Um, and uh, uh, they have now, a, I believe, a three-day program. Uh, and it's a standalone event and, and there's more interest. So so this is this is rather cool. Yeah. So, I mean, in, in your view, uh, what do you think has, has reinvigorated the, the interest in it? I mean, there certainly is a school of thought that... Um, by some people that, you know, symbols maybe aren't needed at all. And there are also, you know, schools of thought by others where, um, you know, you just use the neural model to, you know, uh, uh, create symbols just kind of in a vacuum by itself and then manipulate those symbols using something else, which I wouldn't really think of that as neurosymbolic either. So, you know, why do you think so many people have been attracted to this, 
you know, synthesis of the two. And you know, the interesting thing is that this attraction was always there. I mean, but whenever I talked about this topic somewhere, even during the AI winter, right? Uh, people usually said, yeah, this is important, right? Uh, but it's 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 not a topic, you know, that, that can easily be done, you know, right now and it's essentially impossible to get funding. So the interest was always there. There was perhaps even more interest even during the AI winter from... Um, from from the from cognitive science uh, as a discipline, because and, and and that's probably a motivation from which kind of which really makes sense also for the area. If you think of of uh, artificial neural networks as an abstraction of of our neural system, right, the, the biological substrate, but then you can think of formal logic, of course, as another type of abstraction uh, of certain aspects of our thinking. In this case, a mathematical abstraction. Um, and they both make sense in different contexts, and they have they have very very different capabilities and so on. So so uh, for the cognitive scientists, the question is, how do you get these two abstractions together in a model which which can kind of do both? And for the computer scientists, the question is, how can you uh, make a a a a system, a, co a computational system? Um, which in a sense uh, combines the best of both worlds, meaning the the transparency and the, the explainability, the the introspectability of of symbolic systems with the with the really strong machine learning aspects, which which of course drives uh, artificial neural networks, in, in particular deep learning these days. So so that motivation was always there. Um, it's just that there was no funding, right? <laughs> as we know, right? So that, that determines a lot. Um, the, there was, there was, of course, the, the big driver right now is deep learning, right? Um, and um, and uh, it, it, it was rather interesting uh, also for me to suddenly see the topic of neurosymbolic really bubbling up, coming kind of uh, uh, out of out of the deep the deep learning community. Um, but if you think about it, it also makes sense. I mean, um, we have we have tremendous progress regarding deep learning systems, of course, in the last 10 years. I mean, it's, it's breathtaking. And they were solving problems we all thought they're a decade or two away, right? Um, but um, despite all that, people are also starting to notice that there are problems with them. Um, and they start noticing them more and more and limitation and things that are really very, very difficult to do. Um, and we, we, we can talk about a few examples if that's of interest. Um, and essentially one of one of the things then is to say, well, okay, so what, what can we do to get around the problem that the only thing we know about deep learning systems right now is that they're black boxes and we have a statistical assessment of their performance. So you need to get a, a better handle on them. And to get a better handle on them, you try to combine them with symbolic approaches, which you can actually manipulate. You know what's going on, you can analyze what's going on and so on. Uh, and that provides the added value. So that from that perspective, it's, it's, it's not that surprising. Um, so deep learning, of course, as the engine, uh, one of the things I looked into was trying to do logical reasoning with with uh, with the, with neural networks. That was a problem, for example, that pre deep learning was completely out of scope. It was it was just impossible with whatever three layer perceptrons and similar things. And now actually there's progress, right? So that that's what deep learning uh, gives us. Um, so first that, and the second, then of course, as, as mentioned, um, trying to to address the the limitations of deep learning systems, which we already kind of notice are coming. Oh, and the other aspect you said um, in your question. Yes, there have always been people. There are still people who say um, you don't need symbolic. Um, you can do it just using. Um, whatever, embeddings in, in vector space. Uh, you only need deep learning, you need nothing else. And really my opinion on this is the verdict is out there. We have no idea. We, we really don't know. Um, and, and while of course it makes complete sense to just drive uh, the pure machine learning angle uh, and see to what extent uh, we, we, can, we can really uh, get over the limitations, in the same sense it makes sense to say, well, let's also use other approaches because we do not know what will what will win out in the end. Uh, and so from that perspective, it, it completely makes sense to look at neurosymbolic approaches as well.
So you you touched on something that was an interesting point there, um, where on one hand, you know, deep learning has helped advanced uh, advance uh, deductive inference a bit, and then on the other hand, you see sort of a, a different um, uh, thread in neural symbolic where you can do things. Um, with symbols to sort of you know constrain or or reason about the the neural network um in your mind are these two things different are they related um and especially you know my mind also here goes to explainability like if you're approximating inference with the neural network are you sacrificing explainability or is there anything that could be done and I'm, so i'm really interested in this this dichotomy here so, so from um, so your 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 question regarding regarding kind of uh different neural symbolic strands being related, let let me just put it that way. I think there is a a, a kind of abstract core problem related to neural symbolic, and um, and that that problem is the matter of representation of information. Um, and that actually ties back to my dissertation, but I won't talk too much about that. <laughs> but, uh, so, so the, the problem here is that, of course, um, in the symbolic world, well, you have symbols, right? I mean, if you if you kind of talk core of the symbolic world, you have symbolic logic. That's that's kind of the, the core of the neurosymbolic. Although, you know, we don't need to go there to be neurosymbolic. It can also be structured. Uh, uh, structured data, you know, in whatever trees and graphs. That's that's in a sense that's all that's also symbolic, right? Although it's it's not logical reasoning uh, as such, or usually not written up as such. Mathematically, of course, it is as well. Um, and uh, on on the on the deep learning or artificial neural network sides, of course, you have everything in vector space, in in high dimensional vector space, um, and uh, embeddings is is the keyword, of course. And uh, and these two things, these two types of spaces, namely on the one hand the continuous, differentiable, high-dimensional Euclidean space, or something similar, uh, if you want to make it whatever convex or concave or whatever geometric, um, but it's it's in particular differentiable. It's continuous. It's differentiable. Uh, while symbolic spaces are not, uh, they're highly discrete and they're by design discrete. And uh, and that is a problem, right? Um, and now going back to mathematics, um, mathematics talk about homomorphisms a lot. Uh, a homomorphism mathematics is is really uh, the ability to take one mathematical structure and another mathematical structure and map them to each other such that all important properties are conserved. That's essentially what a homomorphism is. And if you look at the discrete and the continuous world. Um, from the perspective of mathematical spaces, then they are they are essentially incompatible. Well, there are some bridges. Again, that's my dissertation, a part of it, but it, they're very sparse and and they're not necessarily practical. And so, getting away from the mathematics, uh, practically speaking, on the one hand you have the world of symbols. On the other hand, you have uh, things represented with vectors of real numbers. And um, and they just don't fit really. But to make neurosymbolic work, you always have to transition from one to the other or back. Uh, and that is a common problem, essentially in most neurosymbolic world work you you can see. Um, of course, there is there is some some approaches and some things that 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 have been done where it's where it's much easier. Like for example, if you take a a classifier, a neural classifier, and you know it has problems, right? Um, uh, heard a, a, a very, a very interesting presentation by, by Leilani Gilpin recently on, on, on work with autonomous cars and the problem that, well, yeah, sometimes they just misinterpret what the cameras see and that can lead to serious incidents, right? So, so what they did was they, 
they made a, a rule-based system, a rule base, and essentially took the classifier first and then attached the rule base at the end to make a sanity check whether what the classifier says actually makes sense in the context, right? That's a, that's great work. That That's cool. That's completely neurosymbolic. Um, in a sense, that, that solves that transition problem uh, by essentially saying, well, okay, we make a classifier which produces simple symbolic output, namely a classification, and then we can put a rule-based system on that. Um, if you want to do things that are more intricate than that, then you start becoming interested in uh, trying to read a symbolic representation out of internal activation patterns out of out of vector representations directly or the other way around how you use symbolic information and embed it in vector space such that the symbolic meanings remain preserved and of course graph neural networks go there logic tensor networks try to go there uh, but it's all very very bumpy at this stage right so so this transition is central uh, to, to the to the many many aspects of 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 solving neurosymbolic challenges. So, so yeah, you, you had a, a couple interesting things I, I want to touch on there. Um, I think I think kind of first off is, uh, I think I think it's interesting you you bring up an, another sort of pair of things uh, at the end there where you talk about um, the challenges of embedding symbols into vector space and then versus going the other way, you know, things like, uh, you know, um, understanding what individual neurons are doing and if there's a symbolic representation. Um, and in this kind of you know, pair of lines of research, they both seem to be directly tackling the earlier uh, incompatibility you mentioned of, you know, vectors and embeddings versus, uh, you know, like symbols and, and tables. Um, and, you know, and then you make the comment that it's it's bumpy. So what, what do you think are some of the major challenges in these, these two lines of, of research that are that are really frustrating and, and need to be solved. I mean, you know, I, 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 kind of the mantra I always had in the last twenty years is neurosymbolic research is hard, <laughs> so it's difficult to bridge the gaps, right? Uh, so in general, but but uh, uh, kind of kind of let's get at it a little bit more concretely, right? So one of the things, for example, that uh, that we're looking at is trying to understand. Um, what exactly is going on in hidden layers of neural networks? So can we attach symbolic meaning, uh, you know, uh, essentially logical expressions uh, to, to, to what, what the activation of, of a neuron or ensemble of neurons in, in the hidden layer means? Um, now, that, that alone is, a, is an assumption. Right, we we kind of, or it's a hypothesis, right? It's a hypothesis that we'll be able to do that. We do not know, right? Before we manage, we do not know the 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 the, the things. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that a deep neural network, uh, in in its hidden layers, represents something meaningful in terms of its activation patterns, but it's not clear whether it's meaningful for humans. It may just classify the world and categorize and slash and slice the world in in ways which do not make sense for us, but which make it still work as a as a classifier, right? And if you look at that and you you look at that problem of trying to kind of look into the black box and make a glass box out of it or something like that, because you 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 would like to understand uh, what happens internally, what activation patterns mean, then you're you're running into immediately into significant challenges. The, the first one is simply scalability of your analysis. Because um, while activations of individual neurons may signify something, it's probably more likely that it's it that, that the information is distributed, meaning you have to look at uh, like simultaneous activation of different network, different nodes in the network. 
um, and what they may signify. Now, if you have a layer with, you know, even a hundred uh, hidden neurons only, then the number of subsets you would have to analyze is two to the power of a hundred if you do brute force it, right? So you have your scalability problem right there. So that 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 is one aspect. Another aspect is what I alluded to earlier, kind of what actually is the network talking about internally? So what, what are the representation categories? And of course, we can start, even if we start with categories that are human understandable, and these are the ones we need to look at because otherwise expl explanations won't help us much. Um, we want to know what a convolutional neural network does that, that does scene analysis, you know, inside what the hidden neurons speak about. Do they speak about the objects on the image? Do they speak about about hues and colors? Do they speak about lines? Do they speak about um, uh, uh, you know combination of complex shapes? Right? Uh, we have no idea. So so what what are we going to look for in our analysis? And there you have another scalability problem um, at your hand. Um, so th that's, for example, a, a major issue in in trying to really look into neural networks that that which we have so many unknown parameters, uh, which we would need to look at. And essentially, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. I'm pretty sure there are needles in there, but the haystack is huge. Yeah, as you as you talk about that, it kind of makes me think in a, uh, another video on this podcast, we have, uh, you know, we have a talk with Louis Lamb and, and my, my friend uh, Gerardo Samari asks him, you know, can neurosymbolic be used to address the explainability issue? And I was sort of expecting him to come out there and be just saying yes, <laughs> you know, but he doesn't. He says he says it remains to be seen. Um, do you think he's, you, you know, do you think these kind of issues might be one of the reason why uh, some may think the jury's still out there on how well neurosymbolic can address explainability. So, you know, first of all, I, I know Louis well, right? He was he was early early involved in the in the in the workshop series, for example, and, and he and Arthur go back for ages. Uh, and, uh, and and I really I really like it that he doesn't try to oversell this, right? Um, because we we researchers sometimes try to oversell during a hype, right? Um, and we all need to do it to a certain extent, in particular when you write proposals. <laughs> um, we know that. Uh, but 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 seriously, yeah, I mean it remains to be seen. Of course, I'm banking on it, right? Do I do I think that symbolic analysis of hidden activation will yield tangible results? I think that it's very likely, and that's why I'm kind of putting a lot of effort into that line, uh, into that slow-going line of analysis and work. Um, but in the end, I do not know, right? Um, but in the end, I also do not really know about a good alternative to that. Because if I look at explainable AI work, um, that kind of whatever, some mainstream things, right, that, that are being done, like, for example, um, uh, that, that was early explainability work where, where they essentially um, uh, back back computed um, activations and made heat maps, right? Which, you know, if you have images as input, you can kind of uh, display heat maps on the images saying, kind of, okay, so this is what the network mostly looked at to come up with this classification. You know, that's nice, but that's not really explaining. It's the human who looks at the heat map tries to read into what that means, right? So it also doesn't really explain what's what's going in inside in detail, right? And and I, it's not clear to clear immediately how you can also put that into into uh, into other scenarios, for example. So so that that's one of the things, right? Um, that has been done, but but the output is not something, for example, you can easily use for further computation, like if you had logical formula explaining hidden activation patterns, which is what we're trying to do. Another example is, so another another uh, approach to explainability uh, is, is, I think it's sometimes called white box approach, where you essentially take a small number of concepts um, which are supposedly helpful in explaining whatever the classification output, 
And then you design your system that it not only learns the classification, but at the same time also the this whatever handful of categories which you want to use as explanations. And I mean that's nice. That works in some scenarios, but th that's not that's not really what what you know will 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 massively advance the, the general issue. The general issue is you have a performing system and you want to know what goes on inside without predisposing a small number of categories. Um, like, for example, in our analysis, which we're attempting, we're, we're looking at background knowledge that has, you know, 2 million classes and stuff like that. Um, so so that, that's a different order of magnitude. Of course, we need to kind of span a, a, a broad uh, a broad net because we don't know what exactly the network is looking at. So, so here, here I just see see. Um, I don't see really another way forward to really understand what these black boxes systems are doing, other than trying to tie symbolic information to their internal states. Uh, whether that will ever work, I don't know. But that is to to me the most the most reasonable path of attack of the problem, uh, which can lead the, 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 the most insightful results if it works. Well, I'll, I'll give one more question on this before we wrap up the first portion of this interview. And, you know, as you go through that, like, I think a lot about how um, many people believe that the success of gradient descent and overparameterization is is due to the fact that all those extra parameters just give more space, uh, you know, for a really good solution to be found. And as a result, you can have the same training data and you could have like, you know, a bunch of totally different neural networks that provide comparable performance trained. And it makes me wonder, you know, are there then going to be differences in the kind of analysis or can training multiple networks be used as a way to improve this analysis? I, I don't have an answer, perhaps. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, I think one of the issues which we shouldn't forget in this context is that um, there's sometimes very weird issues with deep learning systems um, in, in terms of their reliability. And they kill, still keep surprising us about this. So let, let, let me tell let me tell you one thing, right? And uh, and uh, that is some work by my colleague Leo Shamir, who's who's here at Kansas State as well. Um, and he's done several studies of this. I'm talking about one, but the others are very similar. Like for example, they were looking at at um, classification of galaxy images. Uh, in, into different types of galaxies. Don't, don't, mm -hmm. I'm not a not an astrophysicist, so. Uh, but that was what they were looking at, and of course they trained the system. It worked very well, right? But then what he did was uh, he actually cropped the images, um, taking only a, a kind of not cropping it so much that the galaxy was no longer on the image, but it was only whatever from the lower upper left corner or something like that. The black background, you know, which was not the galaxy, but you know, next to the galaxy, mm -hmm. and he was able to train the classifier on those as well, with sometimes even better performance. So, what does that mean, <laughs> right? And that's probably the big question, right? But it, it seems that the classifier is picking up on something which is not the galaxy. And on the benchmark data set, it learns to do really well, but it's obviously not looking at the galaxy, right? So uh, if, if we see things like this, then then we really need to understand what's going on there. What is it actually picking up on, right? And to understand what is it really picking up on, what we need to do is, well, of course, we, we need to do explainability analysis. He's done this, this with with brain images, you know, and with all kinds of different things. And he finds the same problem all over the place. Yeah. So, you know, and it can simply come from things like different pre-processing of the images, uh, which was done for different different types of, of, of galaxies, for example. The images were taken at a different time of the day, you know, all these kind of things. It's really, it's really wild. Um, but if you look at that, right, um, it just says, 
we need to understand what these systems are doing in order to be able to really trust them for, in particular, for safety critical systems. Um, like, for example, in the medical context, right, or for running a nuclear power plant <laughs> and so on. Um, uh, it, for, for some application context, statistical evaluation may be enough, right, if you do it carefully enough, um, and, and not only on, on, on the same type of data it was, it was, uh, that was used for training. Um, and, and from that perspective, right, um, the, the question if we have different different neural networks that solve the same classification problem, like the galaxy problem, and the one saw the whole picture and the other one saw only the background and they were both doing really well, then I would say, yeah, now that's an interesting question. Perhaps the one which did really well didn't really pick up on the galaxies either. Uh, I don't know, right? But chances are it may have somewhat, right? And the other one didn't. So they, they probably have very different rationales for what they were doing, but we need to do more analysis to understand that. No, that's that's really interesting and, and a little bit a little bit scary, especially you know when you start talking about mission critical systems. Um, can, can I add something? Yeah, sure. I know you wanted to move on, but so you know, there's a similar things with with large language models, right? Which are, which are of course right now the big craze, and and um, uh, the the problem with those, of course, is that they. I mean, they do they do fantastic stuff. I mean, I, I would like to be so eloquent, <laughs> and I'm certainly not, right? And I will never be. Uh, and then you get this you get this eloquence from these systems, and then if you are an expert on what you ask them, then at some stage you notice, well, that's all very good, but here there are there are these two or three points which are just completely confabulated. Uh, and if you're not an expert, you don't know. Only if you're an expert, you know, and, and that of course begs the question, um, kind of how can I use this system if if I ne if I don't know <laughs> what it's basing its its responses on and what of it is is confabulated or not? So that's a very similar thing, right? To to, to what I just uh, uh, discussed with the with the galaxy classification, for example. Um, we need to understand what they're doing and why. We need to get a handle on that. Because otherwise, it's just tricky to use them in some situations. In others, of course, they're completely great. If they want to write a cover letter and don't know how to do it, you know, uh, chat GPT will do a great job for me. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think, um, you know, I think it's, it's interesting where, you know, the underlying... Um, semantics of what's being used to produce a chat GPT uh, response is, is totally different than what you or I would use to answer uh, any kind of question that requires reasoning. And I think that's the main thing that gets lost. And I think I think one thing about it is mm. that people don't realize it's always doing that. Yeah, It's not yes. like it sometimes uses an alternate semantics. It's always using it. It just happens that a lot of times it lines up really well. Um, <laughs> so when it doesn't, we get upset. Yeah, that, that's what I tend to say, right? It, it's not, we don't have to ask the question, when is it hallucinating when it is not hallucinating? Because it's always hallucinating. It's just that sometimes when it hallucinates, uh, it actually hits the ground truth, right? So so I, I, I completely, completely see that. Um, there is there is another another aspect of this which 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 may be interesting. Um, so one of the things I found is that if if you kind of have a conversation with a large language model and you notice something is wrong, then essentially the a very reliable way to to break it in a sense is to inquire about the mistake, but without pointing out in your question what the mistake was. And just my experience is that in almost all cases, it apologizes for the mistake and then corrects something which was actually not the mistake because you didn't give it a hint, right? So what these systems seem to be lacking, that's a hypothesis right now, of course, but that, that's kind of my lead hypothesis, is, is, is introspective capabilities. They really don't understand what they did. Uh, that's not surprising, right? So, but again, kind of points towards we need explainability. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, so we've, we've talked a lot about explainability in this discussion so far, and uh, and you've kind of touched on sort of the, you know, various aspects of some of your ongoing work about examining neural networks and doing analysis on that. Maybe if we can go a little bit deeper into, uh, you know, some things along the lines of concept induction and explainability in what you're working on today. Mm -hmm. Happy to do that. So, in fact, we've we've been at that for, for quite some while, uh, and, and it took quite some while uh, what we're doing there. So, so let let me explain in a nutshell what we're what we're trying to do. Um, so, essentially, we're we're saying we want to take a deep learning system as is and as trained, um, which is a black box system, of course, and then we want to understand what it does inside. So. We need to attach meaning to uh, well hidden activation patterns. In in the simple case, right, just saying, well, okay, let's see if we can attach some meaning, some symbolic meaning to single neurons, kind of when they fire up and when they do not fire up. Uh, when we can do that, then then of course that that would already be be quite a win, although you know it things are probably a bit more complicated, but there are some indications in the literature that sometimes, for example, in uh, convolutional neural networks doing image analysis, then in the in the kind of later or in the in the, in the last layer, essentially, uh, there, there, there sometimes seem to be co uh, kind of abstract concepts showing up, uh, which, which are identifiable. So essentially, this is this is the route we're we're trying to go. Uh, and the question, of course, then is, how do you how you do, do you start understanding what the concepts are that are represented by the lighting up of such a neuron versus the non-lighting up of such a neuron? And then, of course, one thing you can do is you can just kind of make make wild guesses and uh, and and try them out, right? Wild human guesses what it may be. Um, but of course, you would like to do this a little bit more intelligently. So ideally, you'd have a a large pool of concepts um, and have an algorithm which is able to produce hypotheses for you what a neuron may be doing. So that's the idea. And this algorithm which we're using together with the background knowledge is symbolic, which is why this whole thing is completely neurosymbolic. So, uh, and you mentioned it already, the algorithm which we're using for this is concept induction. And the, the main reason why we're using that is, is not because I was kind of part of some of the earlier work on concept induction, uh, but it, it's really because it seems to be fit for the problem. So let me explain in a nutshell what concept induction does. Sure. Um, so for concept induction, you need, you need three things. Uh, you need background knowledge, which you represent using some logic. And because kind of part of my life is in the semantic web world, we use ontologies. Um, particular OWL and description logics for that. So some some logical knowledge base uh, you want to use for that. And then um, the other ingredient for concept induction algorithm is two example sets. You The one of them you call positive examples and the other one you call negative examples. And these example sets should live in the general knowledge space, in the knowledge base or related to the knowledge base, which you have defined. Uh, and then what you want is from the system is you want now in our case a, a class expression or a logical expression in one in one var in one free variable which tells you uh, the commonalities of the positive examples under which the negative examples do not fall. Um, let let me give you an example. Let me just give you. I have a I have a I have an example which I can okay. which I can show here. Um, so let me tr let me try to do a screen share. This is not an explainability example, but it is uh, it is one which explains concept induction. Um, share screen. So just the slide in the in the middle. Um, so essentially. Uh, think of background knowledge being knowledge about trains and their wagons and what they can carry and how many wheels they have, uh, the wagons and, and what type of roof they have and what shapes are or what things are carried in, in, in the trains and so on. This is an old benchmark coming from inductive logic programming, by the mm -hmm. way. It's called mm -hmm. Mikalski's trains. 
Um, and, uh, and in this case, uh, we have positive and negative examples as listed here. Now they're not presented here to a, a network or they are not pre presumed, right? That they are given visually, but the examples themselves are given as logical formulae, uh, which, which, if you're familiar with logic, you can of course encode that. Uh, you know, train has a wagon that's that's a binary uh, binary relation, and then the, the wagon X, you know, has certain properties attached using binary properties, for example. You can do the same using description logics in this case, which is relatively natural. So. Um, so you have this background knowledge, and you have uh, you have these two example sets, and then you ask the system, "Tell me uh, something which give me a class expression, right, or or a set expression, um, which uh, such that all the positive examples are in the class, and the negative examples are not." And um, for example, a system would give you this in in description logic syntax. It's it's uh, it's this 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 piece here uh, in in this kind of strange syntax, which is description logic syntax. Uh, if you're if if you're not familiar with it, just look at the next line where it's given in first order predicate logic as a set expression, right? It's a set of all x uh, such that there is a car y which is both closed and short. And if you look at the positive examples here, all of these have a closed and short. Uh, short uh, car, um, while none of the negative examples has. Um, now, of course, we want to do this in a different scenario, right? Like, for example, we want to look at images and a scene classifier, for example. Uh, and, uh, and, and then kind of ask the question, what happens internally in the system? Uh, like, for example, we may have the positives and the negative images here. Now, what's the background knowledge? That's a, a, already the first question. And when we started looking into this, uh, our question, what we use as background knowledge, was mostly driven by what data can we get easily? So we came across the ADE20K data set, uh, which is about 20, over 20,000 images, which were already annotated uh, by the objects or by objects that are on the images. Um, and then we needed background knowledge about lots of things which can occur on images. Uh, and after some iteration, uh, we came up with um, with a class hierarchy that we curated out of the Wikipedia concept hierarchy. Um, about 2 million different classes. It needed to be curated because the Wikipedia concept hierarchy is a bit of a mess, um, but that's what we were using. Um, and then essentially what we did was we, we took a trained convolutional neural network for scene classification according to, well, the ADA20K data sets. And, uh, and then we looked at neurons in the hidden layer. Um, and some images did light up the neurons. Some images did not light up the neurons. Um, and that's our positive and negative examples. And then we use concept induction together with the background knowledge to give us responses. Um, and uh, we're, we're we're still we're still in the middle of that, but we have we have some results here. Shall I shall I just show you some of some of what we have? Yeah. Okay. Um, perhaps one interesting example, which was actually not with the CNN classifier, that was that was from a from a from a workshop paper actually a few years ago when we when we first talked about this idea, and we only did a feasibility study, so there was no classifier involved. Um, we just took uh, took image sets and look, if we run this with the background knowledge through concept induction, are we going to get meaningful answers? So the, the positive images in this case were mountain images uh, from the AD20K data set and the negative ones were just some other images from the AD20K data set. And um, the system gave us, it always gives you several answers with accuracy scores. One of the answers it gave us with high accuracy was said, well, the positive images uh, contain bodies of water, while the negative ones don't. And then we said, what? We were giving you mountain images. What kind of response is that? Uh, and then we looked at, you know, manually at all the mountain images in the ADE20K data set. And it turns out that every single mountain image in the data set has a body of water. So, so the system was able to, to, to get that 
out of out of this. And also know this body of water is not a term in the annotation. So the annotations in the images were things like lake, stream, etc. Uh, but if you map them to the Wikipedia category hierarchy, then body of water is a more general term. So the system using reasoning, of course, concept induction uses symbolic reasoning, is able to pick up on that commonality, namely body of water. Uh, so, of course, what, what, what that shows us is that the analysis can help to find unexpected things, right? The system may, may pick up on bias, right? Uh, can we use this to pick up on, on what the... What the galaxy classifier, which doesn't see the classifier higher, picks up on, for example, right? So that that would be questions here. Um, so on so, that, yeah, just, yeah, just sure. a quick question. Um, it, let's just say, for example, that um, every image here, uh, mm -hmm. the positive example, also had a mountain in it. Mm -hmm. um, can the system? Uh, can differentiate between which one is more related to the neurons, whether it's a mountain versus a body of water? Right. So in this study, we didn't look at that. So in this study, we, we were only interested in kind of, if we give it two image sets, can we get a reasonable answer from the system? Um, of course, what we are really interested in is really looking at neuron activations uh in the convolutional neural network and we have some results on that as well so so let let me let me tell you about that um because that 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 may may help towards your answer so we did then train a classifier um uh and uh and and then looked at the last convolutional layer and um uh and looked at at single neurons first and uh started with neurons which light up you know, about half the time or so, uh, so which light up reasonably often. The, the reason for that was just because we had to start somewhere. And that gave us two image sets uh, for a selected neuron. It gave us two image sets. Um, and then we could use run our concept analysis on this. Um, and then what we get is, for example, um, this here. So. Neuron, we call it neuron number four, right? For for whatever they have, they have numbers in our case, um, and uh, and uh, about we have about six hundred images which activated, about seven hundred which don't, um, and then the concept induction system which we have um, gives us solutions which are sorted by accuracy. So some of them are higher, some of them are lower accuracy, and to keep things simple. Um, uh, what we actually did was we just extracted the class names from these. So you have that on the right. So essentially what we what we get by this process, we could work with the logical formulas, but you didn't want to do this at this at this first stage. That's come as a next step because we, we're still seeing whether we get anything reasonable out of this. Um, so for example, for neuron four, we get this list of seven classes, which essentially are a type of word cloud describing what the neuron reacts to. Or to be more precise, it is a hypothesis what the neuron reacts to. Because what the concept induction system does, it generates a hypothesis, which we actually want to verify then afterwards. Um, and, uh, and for verification, what we currently did, and we need to dig deeper into this, but that's preliminary results I have, is we took additional images. Now, the, the problem here was that 8820K, it's 20,000, but 20,000 is, is not quite enough to do all the analysis we need to do. So we actually took images from Google Images, um, retrieved using exactly these keywords, bed table, night table, lamp, one at a time, and then checked whether the neuron lights up. And it turns out that yes, in in uh, most of the cases, the neuron actually lights up. Actually, for neuron four, it was 100% of the cases, which is a lot, but it, it's not always that high. And that essentially is 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 a a, a, a confirmation. Um, and now, anyway, we need to dig deeper on the analysis that that the 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 terms we got out of the concept induction uh, seem to really, in some way, describe what the system. What is this, what what the system activation the activation of these of these uh, these hidden neurons actually do? Um, 
so that that's essentially where we are. And now we are working on 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 trying to refine this. We have a, a, a crude preprint actually from January out there, but we're we're still working on 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 refining this, uh, which just takes some time. So we're looking at at different ways of. Uh, uh, of of uh, you know selecting thresholds. What does it mean when a neuron is activated versus not activated? For example, uh, we're looking at, at different ways of looking at the the output from the concept induction. You know, taking the top few terms only, etc. Uh, looking at different ways of verifying this because Google Images is what we had. It's you really don't want to transition to another data set, um, so we may have to find a, a slightly different setup uh, for doing this. But it's essentially where we are. And, uh, and these preliminary results, I'm actually very excited about. Um, and uh, I, I hope we'll have a paper submitted this summer on this. Yeah, I think that is really interesting that, uh, that you're able to identify such high activations. Do you think that, um, do you think if you did something like a uh, distillation of the neural network where you have something providing similar classification results but with fewer neurons, do you think the results would strengthen or do you think it might make things more difficult uh, here? Because I, you know, I don't have a good intuition just kind of looking at this. Yeah. So, so my, my gut feeling here would be um, so, so the problem here is that right now we're looking only at single neurons, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, and and only 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 a few of them, uh, only a few of them. You know, the constant analysis later on actually can be confirmed uh, through through the ex through the explanation. Um, so my 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 gut feeling is here: if you if you force the system to have smaller internal layers, right? Um, then uh, essentially you do not give it as much freedom to use distributed representations. You kind of force it into a more compressed representation. Um, and um, my, my, so my, my gut feeling here is, <laughs> okay, and, but I don't really know, right? If you give it a lot of neurons, then representations may be very distributed. If you give it very, very few ones, then it may again be very distributed because you just don't have enough space to represent everything. So there is probably a a a a, a middle a middle ground here, which which probably may give the best results, but we really don't know, right? It's a dimension we haven't looked at. But why am I saying this? So kind of th th there's this very, very, very old thing, right? Um um with uh, and, and now I'm missing the technical term. You, that that's embarrassing. But anyway, you 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 take something like um uh you have eight input, eight output nodes, um, and they represent the numbers from zero to seven. And then you 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 have a, a single hidden layer perceptron, um, and you as hidden layer you give it only three uh items, right? And so it's supposed to learn a compressed representation. Um of, of the numbers zero to seven, essentially, because the inputs will only activate one of the inputs at a time. Uh, oh, it, it's it's a it's a it's an autoencoder. Um, mm -hmm. And essentially, essentially, what what these systems, you know, back then came up with was something like a binary representation, because you can squeeze the eight things into three if you use a binary representation, right? You you can completely do that. So so the three are are enough there to do this. Um, if you would force it with two, <laughs> would it still work, right? It is possible, you know, possibly in a deep learning setting that it may still work um, because you have more layers to read out nuances in the activations. But I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm just wildly guessing right now on this. Um, if you give it more layers, right, it, it may not find a binary representation, but something that is much weirder, right, which doesn't make sense to us. A binary representation we humans can understand. If we give it um, five instead of three, then we may have difficulties understanding what's going on in the hidden layer, right? 
So so that that's my that's my guess. That's that's kind of where I where I inform the guess from. But it's it's really a wild one. Yeah, I I could yeah, you could totally think of different things. Like if you gave it six neurons, maybe numbers, you know, one through four, it does a binary representation, but numbers five through eight it encodes with a one hot. And and yeah. you don't really know, or it could do something that combines them in some weird way that we we don't have a good intuition on. Yeah, yes, completely. And the example probably also, you know, may highlight an idea regarding your earlier question, right? So if you have two systems which solve the same task, even if they have the same architecture, right? Will the internal representations somehow, somehow speak about the same thing? And the answer is well, no, not not necessarily, right? Kind of in in one you may have a binary representation, in one you may have a ternary representation, in one you may have one humans just fail to understand or are part part. That's completely possible. No, I think that's yeah, that's uh, really interesting. How you know how the uh, probably what's one of the reasons why all this stuff works so well is also, um, I think you know, leading to significant challenges and in, in uncovering it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yes. So um I know I know we're coming up on time. Um you know so maybe to close out um you know if if you had uh advice on someone who is kind of new to this area, you know, I and I get this all the time because of the channel, you know, what would you recommend uh, a newcomer to neurosymbolic take a look look at to to bootstrap uh, knowledge in this this emerging area i would probably first say go to the to the neurosymbolic community slack and ask there because others will have the same question <laughs> so uh, and by the way if anybody's interested in in joining that uh, an email to anybody who's already on there there's over 700 people on that already uh, or just to me, and my email is easy to find by just Googling for my name. Uh, just send me an email. I want to join the Slack and, and I'll send you an invite. Everybody who's there can send invites on that. So, uh, but but no, kind of what, what what is a good entry point? And to be honest, it is tricky because it's moving extremely fast. Um, we, we have a we have an, a, a paper which we call Neurosymbolic Artificial Intelligence Current Trends that was already two years old. Uh, and uh, or three years old, I, I don't recall. Um, where we we um we did an analysis of number of papers in key AI conferences that do neurosymbolic topics, and uh, there was essentially almost nothing before uh, 2016, and then the next three four years there was an exponential rise, but it was still numbers you could count. Uh, these days, if I look at whatever neurips and just look the number of papers which have neurosymbolic in the title, right? It's beyond those. And of course, not every paper that is neurosymbolic has neurosymbolic in the title or may even frame their work as neurosymbolic because a lot of work is not framed that way, although although of course it, it could be. Um, so keeping up is tricky, right? Um, what what are reasonable, reasonable starting points? Um, so one thing, of course, may be... Um, uh, and, and I'm going to do another screen share. Um, now, where is it? Here it is. One one thing may be the, you know, the neurosymbolic uh, learning and reasoning workshop I mentioned already. The program is up on the web now. So, you know, uh, and, and it's, 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 it's just rather, rather a lot happening there. So um, it's, it's developing into a kind of informal meeting um uh for for some of the of the core community there i do not know what the registration numbers are right now but the, the program is up there uh, at the moment um it's it's usually in europe i do not know how it will continue it's it's really a standalone event now so so that may be a starting point look look at what's going on there um another thing i want to mention is that there is or will be a new journal we will be opening for submissions soon uh, and I hope that that will help, uh, you know, consolidate the community a bit as well, because one of the big questions I actually still have is, um, well, let me put it that way. For every for every subfield of artificial intelligence, 
um, people who work on it, they can easily make a, a bullet point list of, of key research themes that belong to that sub area. I would have difficulties doing that for neurosymbolic AI at the moment. It's really all forming. I can make out a few, like for example, uh, knowledge graph completion would be, uh, explainable AI with background knowledge would be one, uh, knowledge extraction from networks. Um, but, but there's others where it's not clear how to classify or delineate them. Uh, so I, I hope this journal will help with that. The third pointer I have is um, uh, we, we had this book uh, which was published last year, um, which has about um, 20 chapters, I think, or 17 or so, uh, which were invited chapters from people who in last in recent years made made significant contributions at, at uh, central AI conferences to the theme. So that may be a starting point. And there's actually another one coming out later this week. So it's not really a second edition. It's 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 a, a bigger bigger topic, a bigger book. Uh, with about 30 chapters with the same general idea trying to get an overview, but it doesn't overlap with this one. Um, so that's maybe maybe good starting points. Um, and then of course, right? I mean, look at look at uh, uh, say even just one year, the most recent installations of Triple AI, Ichkai, Nurips, ICLR, I think, uh, to see what what happens at the at the tip of the iceberg. The problem with these conferences is, of course, you get uh, very mature work, but you get only the tip of the iceberg because they're so selective. There's a lot of really good work which just doesn't get accepted at them uh, because they don't have space for everything. And then, of course, uh, keep watching Paolo's Neurosymbolic channel uh, because it's a resource you know, for, for a lot of aspects and, and then you can follow up on, on things there. Well, thank you so much. And, you know, uh, just again, want to express my my gratitude to you, Pascal, for taking the time today. And, uh, you know, I think uh, for those of you watching, if, if you're not on the uh, Slack channel yet, um, you know, we'll put uh, Pascal's info in the, the description. Uh, but I really uh, am a big fan of the Slack channel. I use it often. I've met some really great people through that. Um, and it, it's it's been a wonderful community builder. Uh, Pascal, thanks again for your time and thank you for all you've done for the community. Was my pleasure, Paulo. Thanks a lot for having me.